My name is Christina McClellan, and I'm a woman at Iowa. I'm Chief Curator at the University Hi, of I'm Iowa Mary, Museum of Art, and I'm a woman at Iowa. She's Gigi Durham. I'm an associate professor in the School of Journalism, and I'm a woman at Iowa. Hi, and welcome to the third season of Women at Iowa, where we explore the experiences, work, and histories of women on the University of Iowa campus. Today, our guest is Mary Masher, the state representative for the District 77 in Iowa. Hi, Mary. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks, Veronica. I'm glad to be here. Good. Um, I know that you grew up in Iowa. I did. Um, so you've got a lot of history here. Mm -hmm. uh, just to start, what would you say is your favorite thing about Iowa? Oh, I think it's got to be the countryside and the land and the people. I, I, that, I, sorry, I had to have two. But um, there's something about the work ethic here and the people of Iowa that's just engaging. And um, I have a real close tie to the land growing up on a farm, and uh, so that's important to me. And uh, I am out at the farm quite a bit, and my dad still lives out there, and I have sisters and brothers who still live there as well. And uh, that's a pretty important part of my life as well. Great. Um, so you grew up on a farm, um, not too far from here, I believe, um, with a pretty large family. Right. How do you think that kind of influenced you? Well, I have a family of, there were 12 kids in my family. And so um, there was a lot of work to be done on the farm. And it was all expected that we would help with that work. And so we always had big gardens. We always had chores that we were responsible for. Uh, one of my jobs was the chicken chores. So I was responsible for uh, taking care of the chickens, watering, feeding them, gathering the eggs, uh, cleaning out the stalls and, and making sure that they had straw in their nest. And um, part of that was getting pecked by them too because they <laughs> oftentimes were very protective of those eggs. Um, but it was, uh, others had uh, chores of cleaning out the barns and uh, for cattle and hogs and um, others had uh, milking cows and we just had a variety of things that we were responsible for. Same thing in the house. I think mom uh, was really good about delegating authority and she had each of us that uh, we had jobs that we had at the inside the house as well. And so uh, I think that work ethic and uh, just being able to work together with people, uh, learning how to compromise. I mean, uh, when you think about a big family like that, there's always going to be challenges <laughs> with uh, kids' needs and how do you meet those needs. And so I think my mom and dad were really good and fair about that and uh, tried to do their best to make sure that we all had the opportunities available to us. Most of us played musical instruments. I played clarinet in uh, elementary school and I had a sister who played the trombone and another one who was on the French horn and um, we just had a, a lot of music in the family too and I think that was a part of uh, a big part of my upbringing as well. Wow yeah that'd be really influential that's yeah. really good um, and you told me before that your parents really influenced you politically also can you yeah. tell us about that? Yeah uh, mom and dad have always been involved politically my uh, dad was on the school board and he said, if you want to get anything political, he said, there's nothing more political than a school board because the decisions are made um, in a local community and you're oftentimes up against your neighbors who may disagree with you. So he said, you know, politics is sometimes toughest when it's closest to home and you can't get any closer to home than school board. And I have brothers and sisters who also were school board members and a sister who's on the city council in North Liberty right now. Um, uh, my family has just very, very much been involved in politics my entire life. And so our discussions, and I have some very conservative members of my family, and then some very liberal members of my family. It's kind of interesting. The women tend to be the more liberal bent, and um, the men in our family tend to be the more conservative, which is uh, somewhat interesting. But the conversations are very lively. When we have family gatherings, uh, there's lots of political talk, and whether it's dealing with county supervisor issues or things at the state level or things at the national level. Um, the discussions are always fairly lively and fairly animated. If you're not, if you're kind of on the outside of the family and you watch it, you would think that we were at each other tooth and nail, <laughs> but um, it's, it's one of those things that we find pretty stimulating and we love each other dearly, but we also feel pretty passionate about a lot of issues. So, but mom and dad, um, very much, dad was uh, the president of the National Farm Bureau's, or, or the, excuse me, the National Farmers Organization and he was the president of the Johnson County chapter. And they were very much involved in um, 
boycotts and things of that nature. When I was young, I remember them having organizational meetings in our home and uh, remembered, you know, sitting there and listening to some of the conversations and whatnot, as much as a kid can probably <laughs> handle. But um, I found it to be um, stimulating and something that was very interesting to me. And so uh, mom was kind of the worker bee, and she was the one that did a lot of the organizing for candidates and would help them with their campaigns and the phone calling and the mailings and uh, the door knocking and things of that nature. So I learned a lot from her in that regard. And, started getting involved in campaigns when I was in high school and college. I was my junior class president here at Regina and Iowa City and um, also um, got very involved in others' candidates' campaigns. So when it came time to run for office, people said, you know, Mary, you really ought to think about doing that yourself. And I said, oh, I'm kind of a back, you know, ground person. I'm mm -hmm. not the candidate. I like working and doing all of that. And they said, we know that, but we think it's time that you think about that yourself. And we think you can and could be the candidate if you would choose to do so. Wow. And so Mary Newhauser had vacated a seat and had moved over to the Senate and it was an open seat. And I ran for that and, and won in 1994 and have served in the Iowa House now for the last 16 years. Great. Wow, that's such an amazing start. <laughs> I can see why you got into politics. Yeah, exactly. Um, as far as your education, I know that you started at Ottumwa Heights College, um, right. and it was a Catholic college in Ottumwa. Right. Um, how do you think that kind of shaped you to start your college career? You know, it, it was an amazing group of instructors. It was mostly nuns that uh, were our instructors, and um, they were very much political activists. So anything dealing with the environment, um, they were involved politically in campaigns, and um, I think they were really good role models for me in terms of um, showing how women can be involved in politics and can have a role in doing that, and how um, it's important for us to have done our homework, to be informed on the issues, uh, to be able to be articulate about them, um, and then to be able to get out there and talk about them with others and to either convince them um, that our viewpoint was one they should have too, or just to talk about the fact that um, these are issues that are going to be before us and, and whatever the uh, campaign might be, the techniques and the things that you need to be able to uh, sell that particular point are gonna be the same. And so the skill base that I, I think I developed there was one that gave me a good foundation and a good start. Uh, I, I didn't know for sure what I wanted to do when I started out in college, like many kids today, I think. That's not unusual. I had talked about going into social work and had talked about sociology and just a number of things. And then um, when I came back to Iowa City and went to the University of Iowa, I really had worked at the public library where I had another group of phenomenal women who um, also were really a good influence on me in terms of being politically active in the community. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned a great deal from them and uh, also a love of libraries and learning and books. I, I think that was one of the things that just uh, was a big part of my life in terms of understanding why that education was so important. And my mom was always one who said, you know, it's really important for women to have an education because you never know what's gonna happen in your life and that should always be something that should support you and mm -hmm. um, have so it gives you stability and uh, the ability then to do other things that you might want to do. So um, after I had come back and worked at the library, I went back to the university and then decided to commit to being a teacher and, and got into education and graduated then both with a BA and an MA here from the University of Iowa. Um, BA in elementary education and the MA in counseling education. Right. And uh, had taught in the Iowa City Schools then for 33 years before I retired uh, just two years ago. Right. So miss the classroom <laughs> and the kids, but um, also am able to devote more time to uh, the legislative position and career. So I've enjoyed that as well. I see them a lot similar because um, in the legislative branch and what I do, I'm also educating people. Mm -hmm. um, it may not be in a classroom setting, but it certainly is in committee meetings. And um, it's a lot of the same things, doing your homework, being prepared, being able to be articulate about the issues. And, um, and then again, talking to people in terms of explaining why you believe the way you do. Right. So those are things that I, I find uh, 
extremely interesting and, and enjoy the political parts of my job immensely. That's fantastic. <laughs> Um, and then, so like you said, you did come to Iowa. Did you always know you wanted to go to the University of Iowa, or was that kind of in the plan since you lived near? Absolutely, because I knew Ottumwa Heights was only a two-year college, and mm -hmm. so um, I knew that that was going to, eventually, I would come back here and finish out my degree here at Iowa. And um, I ended up going just one year. I got married and then um, ended up uh, waiting a little while working at the public library before I ended up going back to school and uh, getting my degree. But it was something, you know, the university had a good reputation, a uh, good college of education, um, lots of opportunity. Uh, obviously, the, the reputation is one of the things that people look at, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I knew a lot of others who had graduated from this program and had done well themselves, so um, I was excited about the opportunity and the potential of being able to go here myself. Right. Um, what kind of challenges do you think that you face as a woman um, at the university? I know that you said you were very busy and you were married, mm -hmm. and you had a lot of home challenges to deal with too. Sure. Do, what kind of special challenges as a woman do you think you face? You know a lot of that is just being able to balance home mm -hmm. and school and uh, being able to find time you know for yourself and all of that too. Um, there's just a lot of demands when you're younger and especially when you've got a young family. I uh, missed my uh, college graduation because I was giving birth that day <laughs> to my son and so good, I think it was a legitimate reason for not being there but um, it was one of those um, kinds of situations where uh, you really have to be able to do a good a lot of planning mm -hmm. to be able to determine what are your priorities and how do you balance that home life with what you are also doing in the workplace. So once I got my degree and got my job in teaching, again, I started out and I was just teaching half time. When I first started, I was subbing and then I got a half time position. Um, but again, it lent itself to me with a young child and, and mm -hmm. being able to do both then. But I know lots of mothers and, and people mm -hmm. who balance both with full time jobs and eventually I was doing that as well and working full time with a young child at home. And then also then when he went to school, it was a lot easier. Uh, I taught in the same school that my son went to, so I was able to go to a lot of his activities and events. I was a fifth and sixth grade teacher and taught in that building until he was in third and fourth grade. And then I transferred so that he didn't have to have me as a teacher. <laughs> I felt that that was above and beyond what any kid should have to deal with. So. Um, I ended up moving to another building. Started out at Corville Central in Iowa City, um, then went to Mark Twain School and taught there, and that was where my son went, and um, was there for about eight years. Then went to Roosevelt School and was there for 11. Hoover for two years, and then finished out my career at Weber Elementary. Mm -hmm. Also did a half-time job half-time position at the alternative high school and was the counselor for the young women that were in that program, many of them who were young mothers wow. and um, had been teen moms and were dealing with trying to finish a high school um, degree while they were trying to be a parent as well. And wow. at that time we started um, the first daycare center for the high school students and it was something that um, they really needed because they oftentimes did not have somebody to take care of their kids. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they would bring them to school and they would have a friend watch them while they were taking classes. And um, we kind of started out with just a babysitting setting where they had a separate room and we had toys and things in there, but um, you could oftentimes hear the kids. And that was a <laughs> bit of a distraction if you were the mom and not feeling like they were doing a good job watching your child. Right. And so um, we ended up then having a location offsite uh, where the parents would also volunteer. Part of the wow. job was that they, if they were going to have their kids in that daycare setting, that they also would be a part of helping with the, the care of the kids. And it was a great opportunity to mentor them and teach them how to, the good parenting skills that are necessary for a young mom. And so uh, good experience, good opportunity, um, learned a lot from that and uh, eventually it, it kind of uh, morphed into what we have now in our school district which is the, um, the program at uh, Mann School which is a four-year-old, three and four-year-old preschool. And uh, so it's kind of exciting to know that you were on some of the ground levels yeah. for, with things like that. I had also um, been involved um, early on and this was when my son was also little 
um, I'd gotten appointed to the Parks and Rec Commission here in Iowa City. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did that is um, there were opportunities for young boys to play baseball, but no opportunities for the young girls. And so wow. uh, we started a softball league for young girls in Iowa City. And um, I was on the original board for that and was the treasurer for that organization. Um, we also didn't have fields for them to play on. So most of the time they were playing in the parks on grass fields and we were just throwing down bases in you know, areas that were large enough to accommodate them. Um, it's, again, we went to the Parks and Rec Commission and said, there's a need here. We need diamonds for the girls, just as the boys have their little league diamonds. And so um, we started that uh, up and uh, were able to get better diamonds. And then eventually they've got their complex south of town now, which is one mm -hmm. of the best, I think, in the state. And uh, again, hundreds of girls have participated in that over the years. And um, I also helped coach at the time with my husband. And um, we did a lot with that in terms of um, being able to, to work with the girls in the program too. So lots of positive, fulfilling opportunities there. But again, seeing a need in the community and then identifying mm -hmm. how to go about um, establishing uh, the, the framework for them to be able to have that outlet for young girls in Iowa City as well. And so I, you know, something else really proud of and, and uh, glad to know that it's still going on today. Yeah, that's a great program. It is, <laughs> it is. You should be very proud. <laughs> You've made a lot of ground with yeah. um, women in the area, so that's very impressive. Thanks. Um, and so going back to kind of your teaching career, mm -hmm. um, which sounds like it was m completely in the Iowa City area, correct? Right, right. Um, of course, you had to have brought a pretty unique experience when you did become a politician. Yeah. Um, what kinds of things were you able to do with your students that were kind of special because of that? You know, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Um, when I started into teaching, I also got involved in the Teachers Association. Mm -hmm. So our local association, the Iowa City Education Association, which is an affiliate of the Iowa State Education Association and the National Education Association, provided lots of training. Uh, for us in terms of uh, how to work with uh, lobbying groups and how to be able to lobby for your issues and things of that nature. So I got involved in that very early on in my teaching career and then um, when again it came time to run uh, that, that was another uh, base of experience that I think helped me determine that I could do that job and, and it was something I really wanted to do. So I, I have a lot of love for the Teachers Association and what they were able to give me. They also helped a lot with bargaining and I was the chief negotiator for the Iowa City teachers um, for a number of bargaining seasons. I helped on the bargaining committee and then became chief negotiator and helped negotiate the contract. And uh, again, great learning for compromise and how to be able again to uh, do your homework, all of that background mm -hmm. again, and um, being able to be articulate about why you would want certain provisions in the contract. So whether it was prep time and planning time for teachers or whether it was um, leaves and uh, sick leaves and things of that nature. You know, it used to be in the Iowa City schools that you could not take sick leave if you're a family member was sick. And one wow. of the things that we got put in place was family leave so that um, people, teachers who were sick and up all night with a child mm -hmm. um, would have five days that they could stay home uh, if, because there's no way you can teach if you haven't had sleep and you know <laughs> yeah. your kid's been up all night and it used to be that teachers oftentimes would call in but they felt guilty about that and wow. taking their own sick leave and so we changed some policies that way as well. Um, once I got into the classroom, um, I, I've done lots of things political with my students in terms of helping them understand the political process and um, some of my favorites that I, I know have probably influenced the kids and someday I hope to see some of them in political office as well. Um, we would do during the election season in our uh, campaign uh, unit, they would actually decide an office that they wanted to run for. They would do the research on that office and develop a campaign brochure for themselves on what office they were running for and what they were going to 
what their platform was in terms of what they wanted to accomplish in that office. Um, some of them made commercials. Um, they, did, they did speeches in front of the class in terms of telling people about their views and why they thought that. Uh, just some really unique things that I think, again, uh, were very motivating for them. They loved uh, finding out about the candidates and, and uh, what they stood for and mm -hmm. what positions did actually, you know, what does a state representative do? What does a city council member do? What does a county supervisor do? If you're a county attorney, what are your responsibilities? And identifying some of that. We also had a lot of candidates that would come to the classroom and talk to the kids. So. Um, um, I had city council Good. candidates come and uh, city council members, the mayors, you know, just different people. So they knew who their elected officials were and had more familiarity with that. Um, but I, I think, you know, I, it's all about planting seeds. And I think mm -hmm. about the fact that somebody did that with me when I was very young. And I think it's a responsibility for those of us who are in office to do the same with our students and right. with the people we work with. So whenever I talk to a group of students, I talk to them about potential and the fact that we need good candidates to run for public office. And I mm -hmm. hope that someday some of them will think about that, that we have people from all walks of life. And some will say, well, but I want to be a veterinarian. And I said, we have veterinarians in the Iowa House. <laughs> or I want to be a doctor. We have doctors and former doctors that are in the Iowa House and Senate. Um, so, you know, you can talk to them about other careers. We have nurses and teachers and engineers and uh, mechanics and, and a lot of farmers. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, it's that whole thing of you can do other things and then choose to go into politics later on in your life or after you've had experience in the workforce in those right. other areas. And that's what we want. We want a diverse background mm -hmm. of legislators. It doesn't make sense to have all farmers or all lawyers. Um, <laughs> in either chamber. You want people with a, a real varied background and I think that's one of the things that provides the richness in the Iowa legislature is that we do have people from all walks of life. Oh yeah. <laughs> hey, great. <laughs> uh, so speaking kind of about your political career, what would you say are kind of your big highlights that you're most proud of? And you've been doing it for quite a while now, right. so <laughs> probably not a very easy question. Not at all. You know, there are always things that stand out and, and things that you look back and you think, wow, that was, that was monumental legislation mm -hmm. and extremely important. And um, last session, uh, we worked extremely hard on something called government reorganization. And it sounds pretty boring, <laughs> but at the same time, it saved the state over $300 million in terms wow. of cost and it was everything from technology and how we could uh, basically unify our server systems and our email systems and be much more efficient and what we were able to provide the public and services through technology mm -hmm. and being able to do that more efficiently and better. Um, we also looked at um, something called span of control, the number of supervisors to employees in a workplace. And so we changed some ratios there that uh, would have increased the number of employees to one supervisor. And um, there was a lot of backlash on that. But again, it's an area that um, people in the public, uh, it's accountability and it's making sure that those ratios are uh, reflective of what the people in Iowa believe they, we should, they should be and right. what we can actually afford. Um, we also did some things in terms of um, an enormous uh, retirement plan where people uh, took early retirement. We saved a great deal of money at the top end of the salary schedule and then were able to hire people back at much lower salaries, but also gave people more opportunities for jobs mm -hmm. who were coming out of college and looking for work opportunities after they had graduated. And uh, so those kinds of things really can make a difference. And um, we needed to balance a budget. And so we were looking for all kinds of things within state government to do that. Probably the most important thing that we did as a part of that bill was to say we're not going to wait 16 years before we look at this again. Right. We will build it into our budgeting process and we'll do it every other year so that right. it isn't something that we wait again um, and, and don't take a look at in terms of reflecting in the mirror and saying what can we do better and how can we save money in doing that. Right. So that, that was an extremely important piece of legislation. The other one that, that I take a great deal of pride in is the four-year-old preschool um, program. It was one of Governor Culver's initiatives, and um, I was 
uh, lucky enough to be able to floor manage that bill in the Iowa House when it came through our chamber. And again, uh, it's a piece of legislation, I believe so firmly in the importance of early childhood education and even prenatal in mm -hmm. terms of what we provide for young moms who are thinking about getting pregnant who or who are pregnant and what they can do to take care of themselves and that young baby that's developing within them. And looking again at zero to five being the population that we spend the least on mm -hmm. as a state, but where we can get the most uh, investment in terms of return for our dollar. And so when you look at brain development and knowing that most of brain development occurs in that zero to three right. uh, population, uh, it makes more sense for us to devote money and time and invest in those kids so that they can get a good start and be able to do well and be successful once they get into K-12. And, and, and obviously to prepare them then for going on to either community college or a four-year college like our, ours here mm -hmm. uh, in terms of getting those degrees. And so I think the better we can prepare kids for that, the better off we're all going to be. And I've always said if it was up to me, um, we would be doing universal pre-K mm -hmm. and providing that for every child in our state. I also think that that would be a way to bring young families back to Iowa. Right. If people knew that we were willing to invest in our kids that way, I think families would come here in droves because they would know that Iowa values public education and uh, that's something that's extremely important. Yeah. Um, Do you see that as a possibility of happening well, in the near future? If it's something, if it's one of those things where the business community has started to enter into this discussion mm -hmm. because they also see the value in terms of what it provides for them as a workforce. They want a good quality workforce right. when they're looking for employees. And so the more we can do earlier on, I think again, the better off we will be. Um, we talked to the judges the other day and we were also talking to the people in our corrections department. And we also, you know, we've had sheriffs and police chiefs tell us point blank, if we were gonna do one thing to reduce the crime rate, it would be to invest in early childhood education. Wow. Because we know, again, the better those kids have in terms of a home environment, the more we can do with parenting skills for young parents, mm -hmm. the better off those kids are gonna be long term. And so um, I think, you know, it, it's something that I think there's a movement nationwide. Um, almost every other country, China and all of these other countries have devoted so much time and energy into their young children. Right. And I think about, you know, we look at our test scores and where we are and what we need to be doing. I think that's probably one of the most critical pieces in helping our country be more competitive with it, all the countries around the world. And whether it's science and math or whatever, we need to be able to provide that um, for our kids and, and uh, to have that be a universal kind of thing where uh, it shouldn't be based on your ability to pay. It should be available for everyone. We don't talk right. about seniors in high school and say, well, we'll just pay for the ones who can't afford it and the right. rest of the kids can pay for that. We don't talk about it that way. We talk about it as all kids deserve that and all kids deserve that quality. So it's something that I feel pretty passionately about. And um, if it's, if, if before I retire from politics, it's something I would uh, very much want to have happen. Yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see where that goes. It yeah. sounds like it's progressing. So it is, it really is. Maybe we can get Iowa there and get a little farther. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> um, so as a woman, mm -hmm. um, do you feel like um, that's kind of given you that special experience as a politician? Cause that Iowa's, <laughs> Um, kind of had some gender issues mm -hmm. in um, politics in yeah. the past and currently. <laughs> currently, yeah, and you're <laughs> absolutely right, Veronica. We are one of the few states in the nation. Mm -hmm. I think we may be the only one now. I think Mississippi was the last one, and I think they just elected uh, someone to Congress this last election. And so we're one, the only state that has not elected a woman to either the governor's office or to Congress. Yeah. And so when I look at that and think, and it's not that we haven't had good women who have run. Right. We've had many women run, and for whatever reason, uh, they have not been able to break that glass glass ceiling here in Iowa and, mm -hmm. and win those races. And I think there's lots of reasons for it. Um, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, people have questioned that and I think there's been a lot of research even done on it with the Kerry Chapman Cat Center at mm -hmm. Iowa State. But um, I think there are some critical things. One is timing and being sure that 
it's an open seat. Right. I think it, as soon as you start running against incumbents, um, the odds of you winning are a lot less. And so uh, it, it, I think in order for that to happen, we've really got to look at seats and when they are going to be open and then women can be ready to go. The other thing is oftentimes we find that by the time women have made up their minds that they want to run, five men have already announced for the office. <laughs> and so, you know, your odds and chances aren't very good if that many people have already put their hat in the right. ring and have already developed a constituency and a, a, a fan base and are already getting those voters to support them. So we've got to have a good bench of women who are interested and willing to run for those offices right. and to plant that seed early on so we can be talking about them now so that when that seat opens up, they're already an assumed candidate and they can do the announcements and everything accordingly. The other is, and I think this is key, if we have two women running against each other <laughs> from opposite parties, <laughs> If we have a Republican woman and a Democratic woman, then right. one of them's got to <laughs> win, win and it's going to be a woman. So um, those are things. But, you know, I, as, as strongly as I feel about women candidates, I also don't believe in supporting women just because they're mm -hmm. women. Um, I think you have to look at the issues. You have to uh, know who they are and, and know that you trust them and their ability to do the job. And so uh, I think that, that's got to be a critical part of it. And, and I think women are good you know, scrutinizers of that and they are not going to just accept somebody as will, you know, the public isn't either in right. terms of we're going to vote for them just because they're a woman. I think people have to prove that they can do the job mm -hmm. yeah. and do it well. Right. <laughs> That's what we need. <laughs> right, right. Um, kind of going along with that, do you have, it kind of sounds like you probably would have a pretty strong opinion about the 50-50 uh, by 2020 initiative where um, we're trying to get 50% of all elected mm -hmm. offices to be women by the year 2020. At, we have a, a group in Iowa called Dawn, which is our Democratic Activist Women's Network, and they help us not only with recruiting candidates, but they also help us with um, developing skills. And so whether it's um, debate skills or in a forum or speaking skills, whatever mm -hmm. it might be, um, we work with those candidates to do that. My concern about 50-50 by 2020 is the fact that, again, um, I'm not interested in supporting women just because they're women. Right. I want to support women who are progressive, um, women who I believe in what they believe in. And, right. and so I look at that and think, um, it doesn't mean that a woman is always the best person for the job. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 you know, for that very reason, uh, I don't support the 50-50 by 2020 because I feel pretty strongly about progressive women and women who I think are reflective of my values and my beliefs. Okay. And not all women are. Right. I work with women in the Iowa House who um, work against me on a lot of women's issues, including four-year-old preschool and preschool for young kids. Um, they are not pro-choice. They don't believe in a woman's right to choose. And so we battle and fight on those issues. Um, they also are not supportive of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender rights. And I pre mm -hmm. feel pretty strongly about those issues and protecting people's equality and, and uh, their civil liberties in terms of what we have to offer in this state. Right. So I, I look at that and think I'm not interested in supporting women just because they're women. I want to support candidates who reflect my values and beliefs. Right. And who reflect them of this area. Obviously, those are things that are important mm -hmm. to the people in my community and, and uh, are certainly ones that I believe in. Yeah, I would say this community is a little more, it's a little different than the rest of the state, be probably largely because of the university. <laughs> that, that influence is definitely there. And, you know, culturally, if you think about the blend of people who come here to get an mm -hmm. education, you know, we have all cultures, and I benefited from that when I taught at Weber Elementary in Iowa City. Um, we had over 40-some countries represented in that wow. school with the student population. And it was a lot because it was university housing, Hawkeye Court and Hawkeye Drive. Students would come to Weber, and those kids uh, came from all different kinds of countries around the world. And I think it was such a rich environment 
environment for our students in terms of yeah. learning from each other, um, but also, you know, just that mix and blend that um, being different's okay, and that that's something the different cultures are something we can learn from each other. And right. if we're going to start with peace anywhere, um, a classroom's a good place to start in terms of people learning how to, to accept differences and uh, be able to tolerate people's beliefs and their religious beliefs and the things that go along with that and uh, being much more accepting and protective of those rights and their ability to practice and uh, their beliefs in a, a country like this. Right. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, Education is kind of the milestone for everything in the community, it seems like. It so. is. I would agree with you. Um, kind, of, kind of going back to women, um, what kind of advice or what do, what do you suggest for university women who might be interested in politics mm -hmm. um, to kind of pursue some kind of career like that? A couple of things. First, I would say get involved in campaigns. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, you've got a resume already, and, and women need to develop that resume in terms of uh, things that they've accomplished, things that they've done, places they've worked, what, they're, uh, what they've been able to do in their life work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I would start with that. But I think the more you're involved with political campaigns, the more you can understand the political process, what it takes to get elected, and then being able to identify what is it I value and what are the beliefs I have and what can I put forward in terms of why I would be a good candidate and what I have to offer to the constituents in my particular area. So the more they can do to build that resume and get involved, is it, the more important it is. Boards and commissions are a great place to start. Um, city government has lots of different boards and commissions that they appoint people to. I started on the Parks and Recreation Commission mm -hmm. and you know that was one of my first uh, venues into politics and uh, again learning how to conduct meetings and parliamentary procedure and being able to again talk about the issues and budget priorities, how to, how mm -hmm. to manage a budget. Women do that all the time in their households and um, obviously that budgeting is important in terms of a campaign budget, but then also what you would do in an elected position, whether it was city council, supervisors, state government, whatever it was at whatever level it was, mm -hmm. the budgeting is all part of that because it reflects our priorities and you can identify uh, and, and tell what a, what a country values right. by where they budget and where they put their money. So I, I think there are lots of opportunities for people but uh, I think those boards and commissions are critical and they're constantly looking for good people to serve on those. So I think, again, it's a, a great opportunity. It also helps with networking with other women, with other candidates, with other people who are also in those positions. Right. And so that networking is critical in terms of being able to learn from each other and also being able to provide that support for other people. Great. Well, I can't wait to see what some university <laughs> women can do now that we can kind of see your influence. Great. Um, I know that you said previously libraries are so important to you. That's kind of a tradition at Women at Iowa to ask what kind of books have influenced you mm -hmm. or to make a suggestion for our list. Um, what kind of suggestion would you make? I know it's probably hard because you're, you're very much a reader. I, I am. And, I, you know, I, I have been reading lots of children's books throughout my entire career and life. But, you know, the, the things that uh, are important to me are ones that uh, uh, obviously teach me about my political career and areas that uh, uh, I want to pursue. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there are all kinds of books that, that reflect that. And the one that I'm going to point out and talk about is uh, one that uh, you may g g kind of laugh and think, well, that's an interesting one. I wouldn't have thought of that. But um, I, I, now I'm drawing a blank. That's terrible. Uh, wouldn't you know it? <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about one that is called The Genius Within Us. Mm -hmm. And it's a book that uh, has come out fairly recently. But it, also, it talks about the fact that within anyone, you have potential and the ability to do great things. And we oftentimes thought it was heredity. And if you didn't inherit mm -hmm. those traits and qualities from your parent, then you weren't going to be able to accomplish a lot. But what they have found is through hard work and commitment and the willingness to learn 
that there are lots of things that you can overcome, even though you may not have been genetically disposition, you have a genetic right. disposition to that. And so um, David Shank was here recently and spoke about that. And um, the book is one that is got lots of anecdotal stories about people who you wouldn't have thought would have been able to achieve the things they did. But again, it was through that hard work and that commitment and perseverance. I think one of the things that they find is that the, the more you are able to repeat and do it over and over again and become better and better at it, um, the more you can accomplish. And so I think that's true for women as well in terms of what we try to do and, and what we can accomplish is being able to, to look at things and say, um, if I put my mind to it, um, I can do this and I can do it well. And giving yourself the opportunity and the time to be able to develop those skills uh, and interests that you might have to be able to, to accomplish those things. So whether it's in music, politics, art, you know, whatever it might be, that those are areas that you really need to nurture right. and you need to do it. At, and there were people in their lives who certainly influenced them but it was also somewhat of an innate uh, you know, feeling that I really want to learn more about this and I really want to do better. And so um, fascinating book and a great read and one that uh, um, I think uh, you would find interesting as well. I hope you'll take the time to yeah, look at it. Sounds like a great book. It is, it <laughs> is. Um, well, I know you've, you've given so much advice already. All right. <laughs> um, as a very busy woman at Iowa, what other advice do you give to women in Iowa? You know, the, the other thing that I guess I would say is find good mentors, find good people who are willing to teach you mm -hmm. and are willing to take the time. Um, in politics, uh, it can be sometimes a fairly isolating and lonely place for women, especially I said I was at a meeting the other day and I looked around the room and it happened to be with the fire chief and um, other legislators, but I was the only woman in the room. Wow. And so, and that happens quite a bit. I don't always notice it, but more often than not, when you look around, you see that um, you are the, the one who's alone <laughs> there. And so I, I think it's important for women to find good mentors who they can talk to, um, bounce ideas off of. Um, we have a good core of women in the Iowa House right now who are good friends and also are ones who will challenge each other. So it isn't that they accept everything I propose or that I think, and, and the same with me, I will challenge them and, and get them to think out of the box and to start challenging what they believe in. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important to be able to have people like that that you can meet with, talk to, bounce ideas off of, and, and learn from. Uh, because there are certainly strengths that we all have that others don't. And um, I think it's important to be able to build on those strengths. And, and not that you should have to do everything by yourself. You need to know how to delegate and how to find other people mm -hmm. to do things for you if that's not a skill that you necessarily have or one that you believe you can acquire. And so I think it's important to be able to, to do that and uh, to depend on each other for that f support. I think it's critical. That's great. Yeah, I agree. The mentors are kind of a big deal, and it sounds they like you've are. had a lot of mentors your entire life. I have. That have really pushed fortunate. you down that road. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I am kind of curious, since you said you're used to seeing being the only woman in the room, does that um, really alarm you any longer, or are you just getting kind of, you've gotten kind of used to Over it? Over time, I think you get used to it. Um, uh, there are times when um, I feel that I'm not always listened to, as well and so I you know you have to kind of watch and see what's going on with the interactions with the individuals to determine how do I become relevant here and what can I say um, that's going to give people a chance to find out that I do know something about that mm -hmm. issue as well and so I, I think it's uh, pretty important to, um, to not let that intimidate you and uh, to also realize that, you know, that's just the way it is. And in order to change that, I mean, I think about, you know, we have three Supreme Court justices right now who are women. Mm -hmm. And they say there's a tipping point in terms of a critical mass that you need. And three seems to be the number. And so once you get that three, um, then we can start again uh, broadening the number and, and uh, getting those ideas and opinions out there and uh, really affecting change. I do think women can work really well together. 
and um, oftentimes look for consensus and, and try to find areas where they can reach that common ground. Um, I do see that oftentimes in, in meetings and sometimes they go about things a little differently. Um, women tend to work harder in terms of they, they looked for the detail and they want to make sure that whatever they do, they do well. Right. And so I, I do think that they tend to try to to make sure that they do all, you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's because they want to be well prepared right. when they go into a setting and there are a lot of other men there because they feel like they're being judged and they need to make sure that they live up to that. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. I you feel like so we welcome. learned a lot and I can't wait to see how much more you can get done in your office. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much, Veronica. Appreciate Thank it immensely. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Hi, I'm Mary Masher and I'm a woman at Iowa.